Hi, this is Bright Sifra with the Fred's Podcast, and we'd like to uh, like to invite, and uh, not invite, welcome. welcome, welcome Mike Stock. Yes. How are you, Mike? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for inviting me on. It's, it's uh, a pleasure. Uh, uh, absolute nice, pleasure. Nice to talk and it's been, uh, we've really enjoyed actually re- researching it. I just want to tell people, because mm. I, I said to you earlier, you're a bit of a nightmare researcher, <laughs> because I've got, this, <laughs> I've got all this paperwork on you. Because exactly. there's so much, there is so much info. It's yeah. just, uh, it's well, it's really impressive. It, it is firstly what it is. Absolutely. Um, and we were discussing this. My, my wife is a big fan of eighties music. We were talking about, and understand she's just a punter, so she doesn't really know necessarily who wrote stuff or who produced stuff. But when she said, "Who are you talking to?" I talked to Mike Stock. Well, who, who, who's that then? I said, "Well, do you know this song?" And I just went through "Dead or Alive" and Hazel Dean and yeah, Kylie, yeah. and she's the whole, "Oh, okay, <laughs> right, exactly. I know him." Exactly. And it's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting that that um, that that legacy is really impressive, um, and not well, very few people. Well. Trevor Hall, maybe, and mm. a few others, but that, that that degree of success is 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 well, it's rocking horse shit, one, isn't it? Thing, you just it's, it's rare. Yeah. You know? One thing I didn't know, Mike, was um, the way you started, which I thought was interesting, which was playing the hotels and all that kind mm. of stuff as a regular job. And one of the things you said, which really gave me pause for thought, was that quote you said: "Once I hit 30, <laughs> it's, a, it's a it's a young man's game going on the road." <laughs> Thanks for that. Thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when you decided to concentrate on the studio. So tell me yeah. about that those early days, can you? Yeah, just in the studio, yeah. shopping. I, well, I mean, look, I don't think my in that regard, my story is unique because I think everyone who goes into the music industry has got to have some background, you know, mm. in terms of uh, understanding an audience. And that's that's what that those years taught me. I mean, there's the example I always give of playing at the Dorchester and my band were into, we were a bit of a funky outfit, and we, but we were asked to play a 12-year-old's, uh, was an Arab child reaching adulthood at 12 at the Dorchester, and they said, could you play the Birdie song? <laughs> <My band. laughs> we're not playing the Birdie song. Uh, in the end, the, the mother came up and put £50 off each, £50 at the foot of the singer and, and me, the bass player, and uh. the drummer. And I was so embarrassed. I, was so embarrassed. I gave her the money back. And we played the Birdie song. Everyone knows the song, but it taught me. Uh, I did. I did. I started off on my own in pubs and clubs right. with a piano and a guitar, and I just sang. I realised, you know, the old songs. Even then, the old songs were the best. Yes, like, yeah. It moves forward generationally, but um, so I could sing in pubs the old American song, British classic pop. Right. whatever and and then if i went into um a, 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 at that point some guy on a guitar said could he join in with me his name was paul challenger and he sat in with me and suddenly i'm a duo i've got half the money <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> and then then we, then we got a drummer then we got another soon soon we're a five piece i thought i, I can't play pubs anymore but do bigger gigs i managed to get into the hotel circuit right I, so then we were getting 500 pounds a night sort of thing. But mm. I was also doing my own songs in rock pubs around the corner from Park Lane. And so we had to have two different names. We were called right. Night Walk in the pubs and we right. were called Mirage in the hotels because the manager, the manager wouldn't have liked it. He walked around the corner and seen us in jeans and T-shirts working right. for six quid and he's going to pay 500 the next night just because we were wearing a dicky bow yeah, <laughs> I'm still okay. I, I learned a bit about music then also when i did my own rock gigs with my fa- i had a fan base started to build a fan base i'm talking like 82 81 82 and um i started gigging in 1976 but the i started building up a following and i organized uh coach uh, coaches to take most of them were in the east end of London, down the uh, Romford Road and all those pubs down there. Mm. And I, I charged people 50p for the seat on the bus, and we drove them to Fulham. We had three bus loads. Oh, wow. Um, so, so we got 300 people in to the Golden Lion in Fulham. Oh, man, we were there. Yeah, we know it well. We used to live in there. <clears throat> we know that very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the manager, at the end of the evening, I thought, oh, we're in for a bit of a payment here, and he gave us... Six pounds eighty. <laughs> he said, because you brought a coach load over, we had to put yeah. on extra staff. Then you had, to, no. we had to pay for the lighting he had. Then we had to pay for oh. the sound he had. So oh, really, really enough for a burger going home. So that was it. Yeah, <laughs> I learned yeah. a lot from all of that. 
<laughs> no, absolutely. Do. That's I about agree. when we started as well. Our first shows were 76 and then our first tour was 78. Um, yeah. So we're probably, we, we probably crossed paths yeah. at some point, no doubt. We did a gig in the, yeah. uh, in the cub. It was a pub, a pub called the Trolley Stop on the Caledonian Road. And when we, when we yeah, got yeah, there, yeah. I said, can you, where's the microphone? And he said, what? So I said, well, we we'll need a microphone. Oh, I don't have one of those. <laughs> I've got that. <laughs> Can you ask my mate further up the road? You know, so I I, I get that. I know exactly. What yeah. that, we're both doing. Yeah. So what was that? What was the transition or what was the moment um, that you hooked up with Matt Aitken and then obviously Pete Waterman? What was uh, what? How did that little? How did that transition happen? Well, in in effect, I'd, I'd hooked up with Pete Waterman before Matt because Pete okay. got Pete got to hear of me um, as a writer of songs and he was managing a producer called Pete Collins who'd produced okay. musical youth and Nick Kershaw All um, right. and they wanted to produce a song of, that I'd written. So I, I, I knew that Pete knew me as a writer, but I was still gigging at the time. And the drug, the guitarist who'd fallen off stage for the nth, nth time drunk, <laughs> right? I sacked him again. Cause you can't do that at the Dorchester and the Hilton. So, um, the girl singer said to me, well, I know a guitarist called Matt Aiken. Maybe he'd like a gig. And I called oh, Matt. Oh, cool. Okay. And, and that night, he turned up at the Royal Garden uh, in Kensington. And I, we just just before the gig, I, he, he went. I went through the numbers with him, and he knew them all. They were just disco, modern songs that he knew. Yeah. A great guitarist, and he was in the band that evening. The only stipulation was, I said, have you got a dark suit? Other than that, you're in. And, um, <laughs> And we and we started working together from there. That was about 1982, right? Um, and I'd met Waterman in 1980, I think it was, as a right. writer. So uh, after I, I what I what I'd realised, mm. um, I'd worked with bands on stage. So I, I we would fill in the disco gap when when you had Joe Loss or Ray McVeigh or some of these big bands I on the stage. Oh, right? okay, okay. Yeah. And so I realised because Joe Loss at the time was in his 70s. I thought, well, you, I could keep doing this forever. We were quite good at it. And I, I said to the band, I made up my mind that uh, New Year's Eve 83, I said, look, I'm, I'm knocking the gigs on the head. I'm going into the studio. I built a studio under my house. And I'm, I'm going to just go into the big world of music production and see where that takes me, because I think we could be doing this for the, the rest of our lives. Mm, and right. the, the girl singer said, well, I'm off, mate. I'm going to the gigs. And the drummer said, no, I don't want to bother. The guitarist said, I'm going. And the keyboard said, blah, blah, blah. but Matt said, I'm coming with you. And we, oh, went, we went down into the studio. We had no no money, no safety oh. net. Yeah. Took that away completely. We were on the tightrope. Um, we were just hoping to get somewhere. So January 84, we put a song together. And I thought, I'll just take this to Pete Waterman. He knew me before as a writer. And so Matt and me went up to Camden. We had an office and played in the song. And he said, yeah, I, I get it. February... That's a month later, we're in the Marquee Studios in Wardour Street and we make right. our first record. And we do quite well in the chart, in the high energy charts. The second record mm. we make, we're, we're in the uh, top 20. And the third record we make, we're in the top five. So, so that, the third record was Hazel Dean, wasn't it? That was your, that was your first top 10, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, okay. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah which is um, whatever I do. Exactly, yeah. We've got We've got a little clip of that. Got a, and we've got a clip of we're that. We're going to play a little clip of that. Is it a, it's a German, it's a from a German TV show. German TV so show. So just yeah. and we, we we play a bit of music just so we can put it in context. <laughs> A lot of fond memories of uh, of the eighties. One thing I'm going to ask you, Mike, is um, one of the things when you watch that is that 
We think, I don't know what you, yeah. whether you agree, we think pop music has completely lost its ability to entertain. The exuberance of the it. The exuberance of it. Do you agree or yeah. do you not agree? I totally, totally agree. I mean, and part of that's down to electronics, the ease with which you can do things nowadays, although computers have made things more difficult in some respects, but tuning a vocal up, making it sound like a robot, I mean, there's no humanity there. That's what's gone. It's drifted yeah, away from real people and real sounds into more and more synthesised computer generation. And so I think that's inevitably, it, it, loses, it loses passion, energy, and, yeah. you know. But do you think there's something innately different about the people who make pop music now, the actual the artists themselves, that they that they don't go out with a with a view to entertain and make you feel good. They go out with a message and a and a vibe and a and a branding that they want to sell. I mean, I think Billie Eilish is a really good example of that, which is it's yeah. all about branding and not about yeah. necessarily having a good time. Yeah. No, I, I, I always think I I I I, I do, uh, Richard. You see, the thing is. I think there's always been two sorts of artists. There's those that say, come into my world. You've got to like me for who I am. I may, I may be a bit boring or I may be a bit emotionally upset, but come, come and enjoy this with me. And there's yeah. the others which, which go out and say, I'm going out. I'm sending out me to you. Right. And, you know, at the extremes of that are so Billie Eilish is coming to my world. Yeah, exactly. Bassy was, I'm going out to you. <laughs> yes, mm. that's true. That's absolutely yeah. true. Yes, there's yeah, yeah. Been, there's always been two sorts, but I think the, the worst thing I get now is every young girl sounds like she's demented, a bit, <laughs> a, a bit overwrought, a bit uh, on, on sort of antidepressants. I agree. I I completely agree. I, I mean, there are some new artists. I, re I really like Glass Animals. I think they're an interesting band. And there's a, and there's a few others. I like um, uh, Cir Circa Waves and a few others out there. But I, 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 I agree. There's a, also, there's a sound to production, which to me sounds like it's just going through the same, irrespective of the record label and almost irrespective of the genre. It, there's, there's a similarity yeah. to it. Whereas what I loved yeah. about the seventies and eighties and to the nineties to a degree. Um, there was a, there was a massive difference, you know, you, the, between, you know, Hazel Dean and, and, um, you know, some of the big hair rock or yeah. Depeche or, do you know what I mean? There was, there, there was, a, you know, people talk, talk about the eighties. It was incredibly varied. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, but in terms of pop, what I think is really impressive about uh, what you guys did is, yeah. is, Putting a stamp on a whole decade, exactly. that is really tough, man. Yeah, exactly. you know, putting a stamp on a year is tough enough. Yeah, uh, but yeah, we um, found six months quite difficult. <laughs> 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 but I think it's, you know, and um, we're, we're just going through your stuff. And I yeah. mean, I think one of the best records of the eighties um, in terms of the, the songwriting and the production is "Spin Me Round." Absolutely. I mean, I just think that is an absolutely standout mm. record. That and "Relax." What I think the two eighties tracks for me. You know, it's it's yeah. it's got a slight. I, I, for some reason, I always think it's slightly punky. It's Spin got a, it is it's, a bit. It's yeah. slightly punky, slightly yeah. dirty. You know, partly because of the way Pete Burns did it, obviously. Um, but yeah. I wonder why. Ask you, was your influences when you were younger because you you know you've you mentioned the Beatles and then you mentioned Oscar Hammerstein and people Buddy Holly and Buddy Holly and people like that. So <coughs> when you when you're sitting down and writing, do you draw on any of those influences in particular, or do you, or, or is that just a, it, it's in your background and it's in your you know DNA if you like, and you don't necessarily have to refer to it in that way? Well, I, look, I think look, gosh, I'm not really certain of the reason why I started writing. I did it from a very young age. That was what I was oh, no. interested in. Well, you got your um, first and, you were a teen, I think. When I was a teenager, yeah, it was a yeah, seven-year yeah. seven year indention. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. uh, but the, the thing is, the um, the thing that moves me always, uh, uh, the, the music can't. Uh, the, the, you know, there's two sorts of music in the pop world. Really, there's right. rock and roll, which you know, it, it's three chords, but it, it can be yeah. the truth, the truth and three chords. It's not... Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and there's music which goes through structured chord arrangements. And the, the American Songbook does that. The great old songs did that. Ro Oscar, uh, you know, Rodgers and Hammerstein did that. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Lennon McCartney, um, uh, in all of their stage shows from about 1961 to 66, yeah. uh, they really only played rock and roll. They would never yes, have. Right. Most of the time, they didn't do their singles, their actual songs. You know, they would, apart from "She Loves You" and 
but they yeah. were mainly rock and roll. They always did roll over Beethoven and Twist and Shout and Long Tall Sally. Mm. Um, because with three guitars and a drummer, that's what you can do live. You <laughs> yes, have, okay. It's difficult to really put over, you know, the stuff on Sergeant Strawberry Pink. Fields or something. Yeah. 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 I do. Yeah. So oh, I'll just kill that phone. So, you know, I'm, I, I, I think um, I always liked. I wasn't that keen on Buddy Holly, to be absolutely honest, because Buddy Holly... Oh, yeah. oh, I thought you were, sorry. Because McCartney you know, is he's a huge fan. M McCart I am a fan of McCartney, but the thing about Buddy Holly was the big hits, and they weren't all his songs, you see, and he, he wasn't around long enough to really make much of an impression on me. Uh, right, 58, right. did he die? Yes, know. yeah. Um, when I'm 10, the Beatles are suddenly huge, and so that was my... Right. A bit like why. Well, I'm a Spurs supporter because Spurs did the double in '62, and everyone was talking. <laughs> so I'm at that impressionable age. Um, right. So I just uh, I I love the music, the proper music. Uh, I, I and if you're going to just do three chords, it better be a bloody good song. Yeah. Otherwise, I, I just have heard it too many times. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. I think that's and that's absolutely true. But since it seems I was I, one of my favourite bands to listen to at the minute when I'm in the gym is status quo because it's so yeah. it's so up primal it's, it's primal mm. it's in your face there's nothing clever about it um and I I, I value that kind of stuff and that, in a way that's what I like about spin me around it's got that kind of earthy yeah I don't know what you call it you know a really earthy quality to it you know delivered yeah. partly I think because of the way he delivered it yeah okay. well, how did that uh union happen you and um um Pete Burns or, or Dead or Alive how was that um what was that was, was what, how did that come about the, the story of that is that we did Hazel Dean, the, the, whatever I do, and that, mm. that made the charts. Consequence mm. of making the chart was on the radio. They had to play it in the chart rundown. and yeah. Otherwise, they weren't going to play that kind of high-energy stuff. And Pete Burns heard it, heard it on the radio. He came out with a speaker one morning, and he, he, he said, I've, I'm going to find out who produced that, okay. and that's who I want to make my record. So he right. approached us, and... Um, he played three demos to Pete Waterman and Pete Waterman picked Spin Me Round as the first track that he thought we should work on. So I think that was around September 84. We made the record and at, at, at which point um, the band, uh, so it was very difficult for me and Matt to, because Pete wasn't a producer or a writer or a, a musician. For Matt and me to work with, a bunch of musicians it was very difficult because everyone was the, the drummer was fighting over how loud the drums were and the guitarist was trying to get and you know it was mayhem so we uh we took we had to take control um right. and we took the basis reorganized the structure fought with the technology back then it was difficult to get the synths and the drum machines to talk to each other properly yes but yeah. Matt got got round it in some very in, i think clever ways we we beat the technology and we're able to make because because otherwise if that record could not have been made in 1980 no you know no, that's, no. True. That's, that's absolutely true uh, yeah uh, sorry, sorry 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 Mike. one of the things you say in your in one of the interviews is is that you a lot of your stuff is auto, is biographical that you need to get to know the artist yeah to some extent before you can actually so what to what extent was um spinning around biographical did you did you sit down with Pete and sort of, you know, get a sense of him? Well, Richard, because, can, I just, you know I mean? can I just clear something up here? We didn't write that song. That's right. right. It, was, it, was, it was Pete Burns, wasn't it? Pete oh, Burns, he wrote yeah. So he's already, oh, yeah, sorry. He's, already, he's already got the idea for that. And it's, it's the idea that he gave us in a demo form that we took right. to, to okay. record. Um, I mean, you're, you're right in a sense because he heard Hazel Dean, but in, rather than saying, mm. could you write one like that, he wrote one yes, like exactly. that. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right, right. Oh, it's, oh right, okay. okay. Right. But, but was there any much discussion between you and him about production? And, or had he made up his mind that he trusted you because of the Hazel Dean, Dean thing? Yeah, I, I think he trusted us to give, cause, because when you listen to the Hazel Dean record now, like you just played it on the German show, it yeah. sounds very sharp. Sounds, it, it does. Pretty, yeah, it's still mm. got... Um, and I think that's what he wanted his records to sound like because he'd had a hit, uh, Dead or Alive had a hit a uh, previous year uh, with a cover of That's the Way I Like It, you know, the KC track. Oh, yeah, that's the way I like it. Good song, but, yeah. 
it's a good great song but when you hear their production it's a it's a bit lame um, i mean well right. after, after that you get the frankies right. immediately mm. after you get the frankies and suddenly we're having to compete with trevor horn mm. so yeah. uh, you know so hazel and uh, spin me around were kind of in competition with the frankies there yes yes, yes, exactly. yes exactly. exactly let's just play a bit let's have a, a minute of um uh, spin me around yeah, from, I, really, I think I, this is from top of the pops i, I really like this Cheers me up. Yeah, top track. And it still has a yeah, production. Yeah. Yeah. Sound the record is. Let me make great. a point. For some reason, it started off at about 135 beats a minute. Did you hear this? And then it slowed yeah. down, but it didn't change pitch. There's something happening on that video that you've got there. <laughs> Very right. weird. Really? Well, I didn't notice that. No. And maybe it's to do with the broadcast, the way this is happening here with us, then. But it certainly was doing that. Oh, was it? <laughs> was it really? <laughs> oh, I know. Okay. That's in fact, 128. Minute and that was 135. <laughs> anyway, <whatever. laughs> oh, we'll have to listen to that again. Oh, oh, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. all right, all righty. So, um, just just sort of move, moving on. Um, obviously, um, uh, Stocking Waterman went on to you know Kylie and Jason Donald Vernon. Yeah. You know, we we could sit all day talking about the artists. Um, so what's what, at what point did you guys decide to knock on, on, on the head? Was it just like you got fed up with each other? Was it like uh, someone wants to move on? Uh, what Because what with that degree of success, of course, it must be quite hard to walk away from something well, like you that. You mentioned fights. One of the things in your interviews you mentioned. Arguments, what, yes. Arguments, one of the things that yeah. held us back was fights. You know. Yeah, uh, look, there are four reasons that are very complicated um, in life. It's a bit like that. The Beatles split up. Yeah. Everyone all bands split up and we, we were like a band, you see, because Matt and me played all the instruments, did all the programming, played all the arrangements, made all the right. strings and the brass. That was all our work, right. but right. Pete, Pete, not so much. Pete left, um, we worked every single day in the studio, Matt and me, for, for, for those years. And I suppose we were fed up with each other. Um, and I think what happened was Pete moved his interest away. He was doing TV shows and radio shows. Oh, that's right. I remember yeah. that, yeah. yeah. And when uh, the Hitman and Her show was cancelled or whatever happened to it, he walked back in the studio one day and really decided he wanted to take control. Right. Uh, because he'd lost control, because it was driving itself, yes. really. Yeah. And he, he, wanted, he wanted to go... Um, and he had, we had a business manager there, David Howells, and he was doing one thing, and... The next thing, that's what drove Matt away, actually, in 1991. Matt said, there's no point in us making records here anymore because we can't get them released. And right. I stayed uh, on a couple of years. And in 93, I'd written and produced about the same number of songs as I'd done in 1989. But I only, right. got, I only got two records released. And okay. they, were, they were on Polydor. <laughs> they weren't even right. to do with their own label. Okay. Um, so the the, 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 the the drive from the business angle, the, the music music businesses should be a 50-50 split. There's music and there's business, and we accept yes. that. When we it's when it's business and music, a little bit yes. of it, it's wrong. And, and that's what yeah. the business took over the music. The accountants moved in and started counting the beans, and mm. they, everyone lost track of why, what they were doing. You know. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. We've had that. We've been, I, yeah. just, I just to walk away in 93 and picked up again with Matt, built another studio around the corner. And the very first thing we did, we had a, 
uh, number two in America with a bigger hit over here. And then we I did, you know, we did Robson and Jerome for Simon Cowell, sold four oh, million okay. albums. And, and, and then I had to close the studio down because the London Underground tunneled underneath it and collapsed oh, it. Oh, oh Christ. Christ. I remember reading about that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Did and, it, and what was, it was compensation, presumably, or not? No, I, I, well, I got compensation from them for the damage to my walls and ceilings and stuff that fell over. But mm. I wanted compensation for the loss of business because my, my studio was compromised and I just got a contract with Simon Cowell, John Preston at BMG for a 50-50 joint venture to mm. produce and write for Westlife. And oh, okay. I, I said to them, could you just hold on for six months? I've got to fix my studio. <laughs> <laughs> the pop industry waits for no man. And no, exactly. they, they went on without me and I lost that. I lost that contract. So that's yes. going to make a lot of money. So I did try yes. in court for a number of years to get compensation. It's not like in America. You'd, if I had a string of American lawyers chasing, we probably would have got something. But yes. yeah. in the end, I got compensation of £140,000 for the damage to my walls and to repair the plaster and all that, but mm. not for compensation for my business loss. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. all right. That's pretty familiar. Yeah. Actually. So just so, so what winding forwards um, to sort of present day, we just wanted to touch on the, obviously, the, you know, the last the last 30 months. <laughs> so I'm sure we, we've got some similar experiences sure, um, yeah. in, in common. But what, um, particularly with um, with the degree of contacts and your your footprint on the music industry, how has you, how has, how has are you speaking out impacted on all this, you know, on, on your relationships with maybe Pete or Matt or anyone else you care to mention? H has it changed your relationship with these people or have they accepted your position or where, where, how, how is that at the moment? Well, I learned from a close experience with my family members, uh, my brother-in-law and his wife and their kids, we've fallen out. We don't speak anymore because what I had said was, don't get the vaccine. And they just thought I was some kind of a, you know, tinfoil hat. And, yeah. uh, um, uh, and we had arguments. And recently I took up with Matt Aitken. Um, I started to raise the, co I didn't know what his attitude was because we don't see yeah. a great deal of each other but i could tell almost immediately and, and no 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 it's just you know that's what it, it, i said flu has vanished what how come there's only covid and no flu <laughs> that was my yeah. opening ambit. and he said well the vaccines cured everybody you know I go, well, i'm not even going there because that will just we will just fall out yes. um, and a waterman i think's uh, taken the jab and all the rest of it and <laughs> and you know my my personal family my wife my kids and me we have not and we do not and will not take that right, right. okay yeah. Norway, right you know from day one it was very very clear to see that this was not um a pandemic mm -hmm. this was not a disease which was going to cause most people any harm and this was not a reason to shut down the country or mm -hmm. but they created the emergency status and then created the lockdowns as a result gave them power to mm -hmm. lock us down and of course now we've got um People are looking at the myocarditis and the side effects of the vaccine. Yep. It, was hurried, it was rushed into the uh, into in, into everybody, and yep. you know, wrongly. I'm not going to forget it. I will never forget, and I'm going to make everybody who shouted at me and those because eventually, you can't yeah. walk. No amnesty for this because this no, is. Exactly. I agree with you. I yeah. couldn't go to my brother's funeral. He, oh, he's, he died. Yeah. I, get to my brother's funeral, uh, uh, um, you know, and other people uh, I know have had similar experiences. So right. uh, to me, there is no comeback from this. People have got no. to face it, deal with it, and otherwise we'll just do it again tomorrow, you know, the next time. Yeah, there's no, a flu. I, I agree with that. Well, yeah. we're, we're both really grateful that our mother passed away and that, well, dad many years ago, mum passed away about three or four years beforehand because if she had been in the care right. home, and we had been prevented yeah. from seeing, we would have driven the car through yeah. the front door. I just reversed the car through, yeah, yeah. we would do stuff that, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, so, so are you having, because um, I know you work with the Fizz, which is um, the new sort of a um, rebranding of Bucks Fizz. Yeah. Um, are, 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 are you involved with other artists as well? Are you, are you struggling to find people of the same mindset? Where, where are you with that? No, I listen. I I don't go out looking for work. Work comes to me if they want it. I I, I you know, I've got enough on on my plate. I run my studios here, 
Um, uh, I'm currently working on a Stock Aiken Waterman musical, which is uh, going to be oh. um, going to hit the West End or hit the theatres next year. Uh, That's a great about idea. This uh, well, no, we've been we've been asked to do one now for many years, and I think following Mamma Mia, you know, uh, everyone sees it's a good idea. We put we put <laughs> it off twenty years. Uh, the time wasn't right, but I think uh, now now it is right. It so is, I'm, yeah. I'm concentrating on that. Um, right. We just um, listen, guys. You know what I did? You guys came down to that was then. This is now when we Ooh, filmed. Yes, in, Thing. that was during lockdown i de i determined we're going to do something here i'm yes. not going to take this lockdown that seriously you know and um and mike reed helped us with that and he runs his yeah. heritage chart and the fizz right. went to number one on that yesterday with, oh, 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 okay off off the new album that i've done so you know okay. i'm still doing stuff um and i i'll have a stand-up argument with anybody if they want one on all the crap we've been through. Yeah, the yeah. through I mean, I see Matt Hancock's doing <laughs> I'm a celebrity. I, oh, want one, I want one of them to stand up and say to him, yeah. you knew what was going on. You knew it was all, all fake. Yeah. yeah exactly. I, I'm, I'm, we have a friend, a comedian, who says, well, Matt Hancock has been talking bollocks for years and now he's having to eat them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. I, you know. I mean, I, I, if I, yeah, we, we were, we'd been off in the jungle, and I would, well, I'd find it hard to keep my hands off him. I mean, mm. really. Um, <laughs> but but I'm, I'm, I'm guessing part of the deal is no one is allowed to question him. I'm, I haven't watched it. I don't want to get involved in it, but no. I don't know. Well, I'm not watching it, but I do understand a couple of them just asking direct questions. But as a right. politician, he bullshits his way out of it. Of course, yes, of, of course. course. Yeah, yeah, exactly. One of the okay. things I remember when we did uh, the, the, uh, this is then that uh, what was that? Which way around was it? The show. That was then, this is now. That was then, yeah, that was that, that was then. This is, this is now. now. And um, when we'd done the when we'd done our piece, we went back into the dressing room, and there had to be a something like a twenty minute turnaround. Yeah. So that after we left the dressing yeah. room, they had to disinfect the whole thing. <laughs> it must I feel should, great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was just. Pantomime was just uh, yeah. You yeah. had to disinfect yeah. right, said Fred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's exactly. good lord. Yeah, know, yeah. But that, that was a pretty brave thing to do. It I mean, at brave. that time, to put on a TV show, absolutely it was. And um, we're really happy to be to be invited. But yeah. uh, you know, it, it, it was quite. I would have thought. I don't know how many people you asked, but maybe quite a few people were really reluctant. A, a couple, a couple turned it down at the last minute. Jason Donovan was due to do it, and then he he pulled out. And Katrina and the Waves were going to do it. And they pulled out, and it was always just some excuse or other, you know. Yes, but I yes. know they'd be under pressure from, you know, some kind of uh, media department that they were involved with. Yes, exactly. are you? Are you um, like us? Are you stunned at the comp compliance and silence from the entertainment industry? Did, has it did it did it surprise you, or was it what you expected? From from who? Sorry. Well, Fred. from the entertainment generally, yeah, from yeah. from yeah, from bands, from actors, from everything, e everything. I mean, there's the the complete lack of voice. It's extraordinary. Yeah. No, it just well, what happened to rock and roll is all I want to ask. I yes. mean, you've got fans on stage. You know, we know who they are. Who's had the, who's had the AstraZeneca? Who's had I'm the Pfizer? Or well, you can't come to the gig unless you're vaccinated. I mean, for God's sake, this is segregation. This is the it worst is, yeah. thing that industry has fought against for all these years and these yeah. young twats have done that i really want to i, I hope the kaiser chiefs never have another record again everybody should have known at the beginning i'm not yeah. surprised i'm bloody flabbergasted they couldn't mm. see that yeah, well, yes we've often we've, we've mentioned before if you go back to the 60s and the degree to which pop music was at the center of cultural yeah. challenge you know Absolutely. whether it's Vietnam yeah. or the race wars or whatever, yeah. and now it's just uh, it's just silence. Yeah, you know, it's just yeah. abs absolutely incredible. Yeah. And I, also, I, I think it's disgusting some of the events that have allowed this to happen. You know, uh, that that gig was at the Isle of Wight. The stuff yeah. we've seen at Glastonbury with Zelensky and Gre Greta Thunberg. Yes. I mean, the whole the, the, the virtual signalling is just fucking. It's just it's off the yeah, it, it is. It, it is. is. And, and, it goes sorry. around. It goes around, Fred, and it's going to come back. It yes, will. it will. It yes, will. No, I, 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 I completely agree with that. And the, I saw a poster of the damned, and they all had masks on. <laughs> <laughs> the frigging damned. And also, 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 what is going on? Also, there. Rage what? Against the Machine. Oh, right. I love that. Oh. <laughs> I mean, don't, who, they, they don't rage anymore. Do no. they? They're just a little bit niggles. Yes, it, it is. 
a slight irritation. <laughs> 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 no, it really, it, yeah so yeah because we're, we're, we're often we're really surprised by the whole thing i mean it is changing you're right we're, we're, we're over in germany this week because um rtl have now decided to invite us over which is very sweet of them um but that wouldn't have happened a year ago no. um we, we're getting festival offers for next year that wouldn't have happened a year ago yeah. we were persona non grata so i suppose that you know that some of it is changing um and i, I really hope you're right and and, and i do agree i think everything is circular um or cyclical rather mm. um yeah. and, and and it will come back there'll be some bands popping up and i hope they come soon yeah. um yeah. kicking the shit into touch and i saw yeah. a thing I, just, I was really surprised um we, we won't keep much longer but i was really surprised there was a quote from sam fender oh, saying I, I didn't write a song about covid because everyone's had enough of it and i thought well not the people who, who not the people who, who are vax injured mate no exactly. maybe you want to give them a thought exactly you know and it was just and and what i think yeah. these bands are doing i agree with you they've got media people on board sponsors labels Managers, they've all got to say yeah. so, and the bands are capitulating. Yeah, yeah. no, yeah, I, I agree. That's a dreadful thing for him to say. Yeah. I, I think so. Yeah, really yeah, bad. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's been a, it's been a real pleasure, Mike. Yeah, um, ab absolutely. Yeah. And hopefully, we'll bump into each other again yeah. soon. And we yeah. can try and put the, we can try and put the world right. <laughs> we haven't got time, mate. <laughs> we haven't got time. Yeah, we put a, put a week, better put a weekend by. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you so Cheers, much, mate. Take Thank care, you mate. Very much. Have a good day. Thanks yeah, yeah. again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.